You may have one blessing. Mm-hmm. All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to Revelations, Revelation chapter number 2, uh, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12, but uh, you're turning there. Uh, again, I always covet your prayers as your pastor, and the older I get, uh, the more I realize that that is the... Um, that is the biggest need as a pastor, is to have others praying for you. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 12, and I have actually recently preached similarly to this, uh, but um, I could not get away from it, and so here we go. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which the sharp with the, that which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest thy fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou art, thou hast them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank you for your holy word as it sits before us. God, not every nation has a Bible like we do, and we praise you for that. God, we thank you for its perseverance, how you've preserved it down through the years, that even day, uh, this morning in 2021, we can have the full counts of God laid before us. We give you the praise for that. God, we pray that we would be a church, Lord, that would uh, magnify you, that would bring honor and glory uh, unto you and the, and the wonderful work that you've done. God, help us now. Uh, Lord, to put ourselves out of the way and put you in the limelight, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray this in thy name. Amen. (coughs) Now, some uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, conveying his will and his criticism and his encouragement to the churches of uh, Asia. Now, I want you also to understand that these were real churches, and I've heard all the dispensational teaching on uh, that that can maybe be drawn from that, but what I found the very best thing you can do with the Word of God is take it for what it says, right. and, and not add and, and, and view it in any other context than what it was. And what we know about this is context John the Apostle, that's my belief who this John was. John the Apostle in his old age got this vision from God and it was directed first of all to specific churches and then it became a general epistle at the end and he tells of the last days. But the first part is totally different and it was delivered specifically to specific churches. Now, with that said, he addresses seven churches. The famous one, unfortunately, is the church at Laodicea, and what was going wrong was there, and what he predicted to go on there. But the one you never hear about and never heard preached on, I guess because preachers are negative, is the church of Philadelphia, who was doing all things well. He gave them an A+. Plus. He said things are going exactly as they should. And the only church, you know, you hear all kinds of churches named after biblical churches, Corinth and Philippi. You never hear one. I know one named Philadelphia Baptist Church in Alabama. And that's the only one I know. And I don't know that they make make the mark that uh, Philadelphia did, but it is a good name. But now there were issues at Pergamos that dated way, way back, or at least comparatively to the days uh, of the Old Testament 
even when they were still wandering in the wilderness. And that, that, that's who he uses the comparison to. And so he begins, and to the angel, now this is the only one that I, and I'm not going to re rewrite the epistle, but uh, that word is translated two different ways in two different places. Now, there is angelic beings. It's also translated mostly as pastor as preacher and uh, I personally believe they were writing to specific churches and specific men now it is my responsibility of this church and if, Harry's, if heresy creeps in it's, I, I'm the one holding the bag and you know everybody wants a pastor everybody wants to be a pastor but listen with that comes a great deal of responsibility right. And, and you will give an accounting for that, and you will say uh, of what you say and what you do, and how you lead and where you go. And so that's just my own opinion that he was addressing and making someone accountable for the church there at Pergamos. And, and to the angel of the church at Pergamos, write these things, saith he, which have the sharp sword with two edges. Now that individual is the Lord Jesus Christ. That individual that has this sharp two-edged sword coming forth from his mouth, the one that cuts going and coming, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, the, the thing about a two-edged sword, you cut this way and this way. Right. Now, uh, with, uh, say, a weed whack, it only cuts when you go this way. But it, 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 this one cuts when it comes back as well. Now, that's very significant because, you know, the only thing I can take from that is the word of God is also often just a cleaning agent. Mm -hmm. you, you get the brush out of the way. You, you get the things that's hiding your own vision, your worldliness, and you see exactly for what it is. And so we find that the Lord Jesus Christ and his wisdom has given Pergamos a chance to see themselves. He begins in verse 13. I know thy works. Now that can be thrilling and it can be humbling. I know thy works. I, I know what you're about. Now, he says that to individuals. I know thy works. I know what you're doing. I know why you're doing it. I know what your motivation is. Uh, do you have concern for souls or do you want to build na a name for yourself? I know thy works. Now, personally, uh, the only church that was the only two churches I really know that were addressed that I heard about again was the church at Ephesus and the church of Philadelphia. And by that, I have to assume the rest of them went out of existence. And, and he gave them that threat. He says, "This is going to be your responsibility. This is going to be the end of your actions." If you're not careful. And, and of course, you know, uh, even Laodicea went out eventually, but you do hear them mention again later. But I want you to see that he says, This is where you're at. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Now, that's very important because the location where a group meeting is meeting is critical. Now, where, uh, where they were located was in a Greek city right on the Turkish border, and it was a very, very wicked place. It was an oppressor, it was an opposer, and they had a, a rough way to go. You know what? America today is the modern day Turkey. America today is the opposition. We are no longer a Christian nation. President Barack Obama said that. And you know what? That's the only thing I can agree with on that man. Our America is gone. That's not popular preaching today, and people don't like it. But listen, uh, I, I think back into the late 70s and the early 80s when I was growing up, we live in a different place. It's not the same anymore. It, it, it's totally different. Think, you know, things we can say and things we can't say and things we do and we can't do. You know what that is? That's an infringement on our freedoms. Amen. That's exactly what it is. It, it, it's not being respectful to other people. It's an infringement on our freedoms. Different place, right? Different time. Now, this tiny 
uh, area in a Grecian city, uh, a Grecian uh, country, if you will, bordering up against uh, a rebellion. Now, Turkey, if I understand a lot of it, is an Arabian-type culture, uh, Middle Eastern-type culture, and, and backed up again. You know what that is? That's where two heresies meet. A Greek city that had multiple gods and a, a nation that served the wrong God. Right in the middle, on that border, we find this little city. Now, listen, we live in a day and age where what is preached here is not a popular doctrine. Uh, met with this woman at work, and I'm not going to say where she goes to church or what denomination, but she was glad that they hadn't met since this whole crazy stuff started with, with uh, uh, the COVID. You know what? That's a shame and a disgrace because the Bible says for na- forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. It was wrong and she was glory in it. That's the modern day Turkey. That's the modern day Greece that everything is okay and nothing is wrong. Right. That's where we that's where we at. We are at in the modern day. And so as Paul is writing to this, he says, I know your works, and I know where you're located, and I'm discouraged about where you're located, but what an opportunity for ministry. You know what? We live here in the Bible Belt, or that's what they call it. I don't believe it. I, I get what they're saying, because there's many, many, many. Christians out there, but you know what? This is a heathen place and we're right up in the middle, backed up one against the other, just like the church of Pergamos. That's where we live in the modern day. We are the minority. We are the ones being criticized. We are the church of Pergamos. And I don't just mean New Testament. I mean all the Lord's churches that are holding to any kind of truth at all. That they they are the ones in uh, in the spot of criticism these days. I know thy works, and where thy dwellest, where the group is located, even where Satan seated us. Now I jokingly say, you know, this is where Satan, uh, this is where Satan shows up, but you know, that's funny and everything. And so, you know, I don't know that we even we even hire enough on the list to get Satan to come by. But what what the writer was referring to, that was a Grecian city, and it was so wicked. Multiple, multiple, multiple false gods. And there in the middle of it was a sound of Baptist church. Very, very, very difficult day. See, we live there today. We live in modern-day Pergamos where, listen, it's right on the day before delivery to go in and kill your own child and then afterwards it be celebrated by everybody. Is that not Pergamos? Where, where homosexuality, sodomites are, are rejoiced. And, you know, uh, uh, one day I was like, and I, I like this kid at work, he's a good young man, and I said, we need to have a straight pride uh, a straight pride uh, festival there in Clarksville. And he says, you can't do that. And I said, well, why can't we? It would hurt somebody's feelings. I said, what do you think that bunch does to me? See, it's all backwards, is it not? The modern day Pergamos is, uh, is upon us. And as John acknowledges it, why Christ acknowledges it, it does not become an excuse to quit. It, does, it doesn't say, well, man, you're doing the best you can. No, no. We're still held to the standard. We're still held to what God yeah. gave the churches to do. And just because we live in the days in which we live, and you know what? I don't know if they're li- the last days or not. Because you know what? When you lost your head for preaching the truth, that was even worse than the Sodomites who were running the place, is it not? So, you know, this, this is the news flash. It could get worse. Right, and so we see we see Pergamos was a church in a city, in a country, in a town on a border that was just being wreaked with havoc. And he says, "I acknowledge that. I understand it." First good thing, thou holdest fast my name. 
You know what? I don't want to ever give up the name of Jesus. And I don't have an issue. Uh, you know, uh, the, the big thing uh, a few years ago, uh, and, and, and I'm fine with it, is the unspeakable name of God. And how Jehovah, and Jehovah is a good Bible name, but the, the uh, untranslated uh, uh, name of Jehovah is Yahweh. Uh, but that was the big catchword. You don't remember that four or five years ago? Everybody's like, Yahweh, Yahweh, and, uh, all, and all that goes with that. It's fine. But be careful to get hung up on names. You know what the very best name for the Almighty is? Tell them that I am sent you. Because I am means to be. I am means just that I always have been. I am means I continue on and on and on. Ever have been, ever will be. I am. And, and so he, uh, he says, I, I am impressed. I encourage you. I'm understanding that you stood for the Almighty. You stood for the Lord God. I understand what you've done. Thou hast told us fast my name. Another name not to give on is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, don't, don't ever be embarrassed to say that's what you believe. That thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith. Now, I want you to see the faith that God delivered to the saints is the faith that we're still should be holding to today. Not faith like believing faith and confidence faith, but the faith that was handed down as the oracles of God, we're still standing for them, or this church at Pergamos was in a very uncertain time when the opposition was high, they were still saying, you know what? Salvation is by grace alone. Salvation is because of the goodness of God. Salvation came... And we can do nothing about it. Salvation is of the Creator. The faith. There's one church. Listen, not all the churches out there that have a shingle out. Listen, they're not churches according to the Word of God. And standing for that and saying, listen, we're all in this thing together. Man, that's a hated truth today. You know what? I'm not hung in with the candlelights. There you go. I'm not hung in with the Russellites. They're not like them to me. They're a, they're a false teaching. They're rebellious against the Word of God. I don't count myself in among them. You know what? The new thing, uh, the Mormons that are out there, and they changed their name, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Listen, they are not. And I'm not afraid to say so. But we, need, we need to be that kind of people. And I believe Pergamos was. And they were looking at those ungodly Greek gods and how they worship this ungodly flesh. That's where your um, Olympics come from. Just saying, hey, that's wrong. This body's nothing. This body's a vapor and then it's gone. Right. Yeah. And, and you know what? That, that wasn't popular preaching. It looks like the old got a, a got a little uh, problem out of it, didn't he? See, that, 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 that's here. You know, uh, y'all remember the big court case several years ago. Uh, <coughs> if Baker refused to make a sodomite wedding cake, who the government signed with? He lost his shot, didn't he? You know, of course, this is not necessarily a good thing either. I went down to the next storefront and opened me another one. See, we, we are in the Pergamos age. And, you know, Pergamos had it bad because of its location. We have, a, we have it bad because of our location and time. And what people are saying is okay. And what, what people are saying ought to be validated when it's entirely against the Scripture. Amen. And, and so we find them that very... Very soon now, we'll be having to lay down on the lawn and say, you know what? This book says it's wrong, so it's wrong. And Jared and Kenny and I are not going to marry two queer, queers together. And you know what? We may be hanging out down at the other end uh, uh, of Cedar Street just because of that. We need to get ready. Pergamos has arrived. Pergamos is the day that we live. And so he gives them some compliments on 
where they're at, sticking to the faith, and holding on to the name of Christ and the faith. In those days, they held out, even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Now you think about cities all throughout our nation, and, and this particularly was country, but uh, very small one at that, like a state, what we think of here in the Union. And, uh, and uh, think about San Francisco. Think about California. How are you going to fit in out there? Jerry, if you want admission work, there you go. I'll have to kiss you goodbye, brother, because I told you last time I see you. Right? So, why would you think the all sovereign God of the Bible would place us in the middle of such a horrible situation? Because there needs to be a testimony. There needs to be a preacher. There needs to be a people that embrace truth, even in the day. And, and so we find that as uh, this church is put kind of in a, an awkward position geographically and timetable-wise and, 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 and all that's around it, and he says, listen, Satan is all around you. Uh, Agabus died because of all that was going on, or Agabus was died because of all that was going on around him. And you know what? You could too. Now let me let me say this. If you don't stand true, you won't. You're safe. But this I believe, if the perseverance of the saints applies to uh, the new birth, it must also apply to your testimony. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't believe people are saved that live like dogs the majority of their lives. Do you? I, I just don't. Uh, I, I think they are what, what, what you see. Do you not? How we know that, that tree out there is a peach tree? Fifteen years we've saw it put out peaches, hadn't it? I don't think it's an apple tree. Do you? Why? Because I've seen what put fruit it's bore for fifteen years, and that's a peach tree. And, and, and so we find in the situation, the reason that Agabus had to lay down his life was not only because he was faithful, it's because Satan was all, Satan was in control. You remember uh, whenever they were up on a high mountain, he said, all this I'll give you, speaking unto Christ, if thou will bow down and worship me. You know, at least to some extent, he was right. This is his place. You know, you know, while I know that, time and time again, we're, for, we're referred to as strangers and pilgrims by the inspired Word of God. That means this is not our place. We're just passing through, very short term time, we'll be gone. And all the matter then is your faithfulness to the Almighty. So in this horrible, physical, spiritual, geographic location, the Lord Jesus gives them some compliments on where they're at. But, you know, usually on but verses it's good. This but verse is not good. But, I have a few things against thee. Now, he wasn't just being critical. What, what's, the, what's the benefit if you go to the doctor and the doctor's not honest? Now, when Brother Junior had his little gallbladder issue a couple weeks ago, what benefit would it be to you when the morphine hit home and you said, I believe I could go home now? <laughs> if the doctor said, cool, take off. You know what? That doctor would be lying, wouldn't he? Because mm -hmm. he treated the symptoms, not the problem. The symptom was plain. The, the problem was this gallbladder was wore out. And you know what? I think there's churches today, all they're doing is treating the symptoms and not saying, hey, you know what your problem is? The, there's sin in the camp. Who, who came up with that? Who? Was it Moses? Who gave the diagnosis? God said, Moses, get back down there. There's sin in the camp. 
See, God knows. Mm-hmm. We don't know. You know, my, uh, sometimes preaching is the point where I, I know Sally. I saw how she looked at me today. There's problems with Sally. No, you don't. You don't know any more about Sally than I do. But God does. Mm-hmm. God does. And, and so we find then that this man, uh, this member, this person at the church had an issue. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou thou has there them more than one that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Now, most people know the story of Balaam, and we're going to read it a little bit of it very briefly. But listen, the problem wasn't what Balaam, Balaam did when his ass broke his leg. The problem came way before that. A broke leg can be fixed. Only God can fix a spiritual problem. Mm-hmm. See, he got a pretty grim report. Jared, you like preaching negative sermons? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I always like that term, negative sermons. Well, you know, chemo don't help, don't, don't help ever sell in your body, but it does attack the ones that need it, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if I'm giving you a little chemo, I'm guaranteeing you God has it best for you, has it out for your best. It may, it may affect part of you negatively, but it's going to affect other parts of you positively. Amen. And, and, and so we find then, uh, I think the church in Pergamos needed a little bit of a spiritual chemotherapy, don't you? Uh, because there was an issue there. There's actually two issues there. And they needed pinpoint treatment and say, hey, did, and, and so what was the doctrine of Balaam? And again, we're going to read over in a minute. But the doctrine of Balaam was simply this, that he got a message and he says, listen, Balaam, it's not going to work out like they think it is. They're going to be defeated. They're going to be taken down. And you get out there and you tell those boys not to do it. And what did he do? He gave him a good report. In fact, he said, I'll even take you over there. <laughs> Into certain death. And knowing full well what was going to happen. You know what? I can tell you this morning. Listen, honey. You just say this little prayer after me. And it's just, it is just, it's worse than what Balaam did to that people. <laughs> right? Because I, I, I'm giving you a falsehood. I'm heading you in the direction of certain death. Right? right. And, and, and so we find then, we find then as the Lord's people, we need to be very cautious of this. Now very quickly, and you can keep your finger there in Revelation 2, because we won't be gone but just for a minute. Go make numbers. And I want you to see the location of these events that is prior to uh, uh, arriving at the Holy Land, it was high, uh, 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 prior to uh, uh, arriving in the days where the occupation or, or the defeat of the, tri- uh, of the false tribes began, it was in the wilderness journey. Now listen, when you're in the wilderness journey, and I believe the church there uh, at Pergamos was, they, had, they were so, literally surrounded by heathen people. They were surrounded by false gods. They were in a horrible situation. And you know what the, the, the impulse is in a horrible situation is to compromise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, it's not that bad of a thing. I mean, we don't have to preach it against Sodomites because we're not going to let anybody in here, right? As long as, as long as we take care of ourselves. Listen, if I, if I ever say that, y'all put me on the way. Okay? And, and, and that was the temptation. If you follow the story, that's exactly what Balaam did. And it was disastrous. If I don't give you fair warning, the end results will be disaster. So uh, sometimes truths are difficult to stand for, but it's always, always, always to spiritual advantage to do that. Now, again, back in Numbers uh, 22, we're just going to begin in verse 21 for time's sake. And Balaam rose up, that's after his nap, after his uh, his vision of uh, coming from unto the Lord. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and, and went with the princes of 
of Moab. Now, church, be careful who you go with. Be careful of who you hang with. Be careful of your friends, if you want to call them so. Be careful. And the God's anger, and God's anger was kindled against he against because he went. Listen, the Lord is not satisfied when we get in with this world. The Lord is not satisfied when we go against his teaching. And so I want you to see that he, God was on his anger, his fury was upset. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way uh, for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and the ass turned aside out of the way into a field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Now, I want you to see if, uh, if, uh, if Balaam, Balaam's ass is a, is a type into the church, and she could be, and Balaam was the pastor, and the church knew better. Balaam's ass diverted, didn't she? But he made her go on. Time for a new Balaam, right? Time to get him out of the way, you know. Uh, everybody thinks it's such a compliment that the Lord compared us to lambs. They're the most stupid creatures you'll, <laughs> you'll ever meet. When I was in, now, they, this shows you how true the Bible is. When I was in college, we got to dissect uh, a sheep's brain because of the closest thing to a man's brain in size and function that there is. And I noticed immediately when I got my brain, and my professor really liked me, I don't know why, but she, very good teacher, and she came up to me, she walked up kind of like this, she walked on my heels all the time. Mr. Lafferty, why do you think this individual died? Had a huge, what we call, uh, cranial bleed. And this entire part of his brain was just dead. And I said, well, I guess he's had a stroke. I didn't know she could have a stroke. But I said, but that's what it looks like. He goes, well, she goes, well said, uh, Mr. Lafferty, but that's not a stroke. It's where he was hit on the head. Now, so much of the sheep is useful, they don't want to put her down like this. So they just pop them in the head. And sheep number one comes up to the popping station, boom! They drag her off, start dressing her, and st stupid sheep number two. And three, and four, and six, and 15, and they never, ever learn the lesson. You see what I'm saying? And so we, when the Lord said, oh, my little sheep, he, he, it was not a compliment there for him. And, and so we find that Balaam's ass had more spirituality than he himself did. Verse 27, uh, and, and when the ass, this happens three occasions, and when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, he fell down under Balaam, and now Balaam's leg is already broken, and, and ba uh, she, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote her, and he smote the ass with a staff, and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, because thou hast mocked me. I would that thou were there were a sword in my hand for now, for now would I kill thee. Now that happened at Rome. That church was killed. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden since I was thine this day? Was I ever walked to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. And the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. See, uh, that's the day in which we live. We live in Balaam's day where many, many are willing to compromise for smooth sailing. And that was the doctrine they were giving into was smooth sailing. Let's don't upset the ship. When we get a, when we get a stem winder, let's keep that stem winder to ourselves. Then the other problem. So, verse 15. So thou also, so hast thou also them, again, more than one, uh, at least a portion of the church, 
They hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, there's very few things that the Bible says they, that God hates, but this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. So we have to come to the conclusion that this is his opinion, right? This is God, this is Jesus' idea. God says that he hated, that, uh, that sodomy is abomination. God the Father says that. And so we find here that he says, he hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, I had to research this, and probably you boys, preacher boys already know this, but I didn't. And um, Nicholas was the seventh of the seven deacons. You go down to the list there in Acts chapter 2 this week, and you'll see when they were placing those men over the job of serving tables, the last one, and I think, was it last week? Two weeks ago, we talked about two of them, Stephen the martyr and, and the next one in the line. Well, this is the very last one in the line, and that was Nicholas. Now, Nicholas, according to history, and now again, we're into history, so you take, you take it for what it's worth, made a vow of celibacy. Now, who does that sound like? Like the great whore, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and so he makes this vow of celibacy, and he realizes, hey, I can't keep up with this. And so when he went into his wife again, he changed her around and says, now, if you don't have relations every day, you're wrong. And that's what, he, that's what the Lord Jesus, but he was like, neither one of these is right. They're both stupid. But, you know, just for food for thought this week and more research, that's pretty much what the Mormon church teaches too. Mm -hmm. And so we see then that he was upset because apparently there was people in there trying to practice what uh, Nicholas had taught. So we find then that these problems crept in not from foreigners, not from those Greeks that were around them, and not from on the other side of the border where the Arabs was, but where did they creep in from? Right in among them. And so he says, you repent of this evil, lest I remove thy candlestick. You ever wonder why churches cease to exist? I have two theories on this. Well, the first one, I think all things born of man are, are purpose to be born, accomplish a purpose, and die. And, and churches, I think, sometimes go that way. But I think more often than not, a church is still gets their candlestick church. If he could do it to these seven churches, why can't he do it to us? If we could get a compromise, which is the doctrine of Balaam, or add to things that are not there, which is the doctrine uh, uh, of this uh, <laughs> this other man, then why could we not suffer the same thing? I believe we could, could we, could we not? Mm -hmm. Think about the things that have been added by false, false churches. Now y'all ought to know now, this is your test day. What the one this Pentecostal still in? We call by another name. Sinless perfection. Oneness Pentecostals believe in Christ and Christ only. They deny the deity of the Godhead and they deny the deity of the Holy Ghost, which is really weird since they flop on the ground, but I'm just telling you what they believe. Oneness Pentecostal, Jesus and Jesus only. And so, how is that creep in? How'd that become a thing? Somebody said, didn't have the courage to say, you know what? You're wrong, it's two left feet. Right? I wonder why I'm wrong. I think two right feet would be really wrong too, don't you? Um, so I ask you this morning, in the days which we live, I don't know if they're in times or not, but they are in times like the church at Pergamos. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to say? 
If the news is good, preacher boys, you're going to give it. Let's do cartwheels while we talk about election. Right? And then we'll do something different when it comes to work will come out from the one and be a separate. Mm -hmm. I don't see the cartwheels anymore on that one, do you? So we're going to be a Balaam. Balaam. We're going to be on Balaam and say, you know, that's pretty rough stuff. I'll, I'll skip over that. And I'll literally lead people into destruction. Are we going to be are we going to be like Nicholas and say, you know what? I believe satisfying the flesh every day is the way we'll go. Now, that started with the relations between a man and a woman. But then it goes to drinking. It, it goes to smoking pot. It, it goes to every other thing. Because when you say this, when you get into a lie, you have to tell another lie to hide the first one. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the Nicolaitans were doing. And, and so we find here in the difficult day which we stand, and I know that it probably is boring in New Testament. We don't have the laser light show. We don't have the dance floor. And we, we don't have people flopping around or any of that stuff that goes with it. But you know what? It's going to get harder to stand. Don't give up. When I'm gone and I'm no longer your pastor here, and, and, and Adam's generation and your generation and, and Jack's generation is taking the helm, listen, don't give up. We don't need laser light shows. What we need is the presence of the Holy Ghost, and that's all we need. The Word of God and the Holy Ghost. And I fully believe this. If you compromise either of these two things, you're not going to have the Holy Ghost. And no longer go have the word of God. Right? Mm -hmm. 